In this video, I'm going to help you pass GED Reasoning Through Language Arts, or the RLA section, faster by presenting the study guide given out by the official GED testing service. And this video might be all you need to watch to pass the GED RLA, but if you're really struggling and having trouble, then please practice more before you take the test. It's up to you to make that call. And if you want to, you can click the link in the description to follow along with the PDF from the official GED testing service. And if you're new here, my name is Parker. I make GED videos just like this one to help people pass as fast as possible. And we're gonna get started right now. Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door. But when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress, with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stopped short in amazement. Matthew Cuthbert, who's that? she exclaimed. Where is the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly. There was only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her name. No boy? But there must have been a boy, insisted Marella. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She brought her. I asked the station master. And I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there, no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, this is a pretty piece of business, exclaimed Marilla. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. You don't want me, she cried. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did. Sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other helplessly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to do or say. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there's no need to cry, to cry so about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry too if you were an orphan and had come to a place you thought was going to be home and found that they didn't want you. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that has ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Well, don't cry any more. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia, she said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? N no. It's not exactly my name, but I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. But oh, please do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to you what you call me, if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only, I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least, I always have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine, but I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled, asked Marilla with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. So when I teach reading comprehension, I teach students to focus on what I call the SCCT as the reading, the setting, characters, conflict, and theme. Now the first two are the most important, and if you can focus on the first two, three and four often pop out at you. So let's just quickly review the settings and the characters here. And here is not crystal clear, right? So I'm assuming it's at Marilla's house. All right, now the characters are what's really the key to getting the questions in this passage, right? Is how well you understand these characters. So let's just recap what we know about them real quick. 
Marilla, and what we know about her is that she was expecting to adopt a boy, but received Anne instead, and she has a bit of a talk with Anne, a bit of a dialogue here. Now, Anne, we know that she likes the name Cordelia better than Anne, and we know that she's an orphan. And Matthew, all we really know about Matthew is that he's the one that went and picked up Anne and brought her home. Um, the station master was just mentioned once really briefly, so probably won't be that important in the questions. Now, there was also Mrs. Spencer, and she was only mentioned once briefly. Apparently, she's the one that brought Anne to Matthew instead of a boy. So, considering Marilla and Anne have had the biggest roles in the story, we can probably guess that most of the questions will be about them. Might not be right, but that's what we know so far. And let's just touch on the conflict or the problem here briefly. So basically, Marilla expected to adopt a boy, but Matthew brought home Anne instead, and Marilla's shocked and amazed and not sure what to do. Also, another conflict would be, where is Anne going to live? Is Anne going to be able to stay with Marilla? Um, is Marilla going to want to keep her, maybe? Um, and the theme, we don't really have enough to determine a theme yet, just based off of that short excerpt. So the theme probably won't be super relevant here. So let's go ahead with the first question here. So it says, which three words describes, describe Anne's character? You could pause the video, try to figure this out, take your time, go back, look at the passage as much as you need to, then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so the correct answer here is A, dramatic, enthusiastic, and disappointed. Now, the what we need to do is always look for evidence in the passage. So Evidence that she's dramatic could be maybe she's bursting into tears and maybe she's just kind of screaming here, you don't want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Although considering she thought she was going to be adopted and now it seems like Marilla might not want her, might be understandable why somebody in that situation would be dramatic. But, you know, this could be dramatic. Also, this could be that she's disappointed too because she says nobody ever did want me. So there's evidence that she's dramatic and disappointed right here. And as far as enthusiastic goes, um, it also, we need to see that uh, Anne says, will you please call me Cordelia? She said eagerly. Now, eagerly and enthusiastic are synonyms. They're two words that mean basically the same thing. And I also noted, I highlighted the line that says, oh, this is the most tragical thing that ever happened to me. That could be more evidence that she is dramatic. Now, um, so that's the, the answer right there. Okay, so let's move on to the next question here. It says, Question, read this sentence from the excerpt. What does the sentence, what role does the sentence play in the passage? Uh, in the excerpt says, something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim reaction. A, it shows that Marilla understands why Anne is unhappy. B, it shows that Marilla is beginning to think the mistake is funny. C, it shows that Marilla has decided what to do about the mistake. Or D, it shows that Marilla's attitude towards Anne is starting to change. So pause the video, take your time on this, and then when you're ready, we'll move forward. Okay, so let's just think about A here, right? So if somebody, so if Marilla is starting to understand why Anne is unhappy, right? I don't expect that she would be smiling. So I could take A out based off of that. Now B, well, let's recap what we knew about that passage, right? So what is the mistake here? The mistake is that Marilla thought it was going to be a boy, and then it turns out that it's Anne, right? That she's gonna, uh, she thought she was adopting a boy and she gets Anne. And so I don't necessarily, she doesn't find it funny. Actually, she's, she's kind of shocked and kind of up, upset here and not really sure what to do. Um, she also had that grim reaction, which grim is just another word that means sad. And then something like a reluctant smile crosses her face. So it's not even like a, a, a smile. It just says something like a smile. So if, if it was funny, she would probably be laughing. It wouldn't be just a little reluctant, kind of something sort of like a smile, right? So I would take B out based off of that. Now, we have both C and D here, and I can understand why you would think C. It shows that Marilla has decided what to do about the mistake. That could be a reasonable answer, but um, I don't think that that's the best answer here because this whole thing, I think, really is about change here, right? Because she has that grim reaction, so she's kind of sad, upset, just uh, negative about realizing that she thought it was going to be a boy, and now she might be stuck with Anne, at least for the time being. She's unhappy and stern, but now she has that reluctant kind of smile coming across her face, so I think it kind of shows that her attitude is changing here. 
All right. I don't think that there's evidence that this directly, uh, there's not direct evidence from this sentence, in my opinion, that uh, she has made a decision about what to do about Anne. I think it's more showing that change in Marilla's attitude. So D is the right answer here. And I think the evidence best supports D. But like I said, I could kind of understand why you would pick C, so don't feel bad if you did. Okay. Next, we move on to the next question. So I'll have you pause the... So let me read the question first. It says, read this portion of a sentence from the excerpt. How does the narrator's use of the words reluctantly faltered forth give information about Anne? And the, the part of the passage says, Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. A. The words reveal that Anne feels obligated to answer the question. B. The words reveal that Anne is often shy when responding to adults. C. The words reveal that Anne is ashamed of the name she was given. Or D. The words reveal that Anne has rarely been asked to provide her name. So let's have you pause the video, try this out, take all the time that you need, and if you get stuck, don't worry. Some of these questions have some kind of funny wording in them, or if you just plain get stumped, don't worry about it. That's what you're here to do is to learn. So we'll have you pause the video, try it out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's break this down here. So let's just go one by one here. Let's look at B here. The words reveal that Anne is often shy when responding to adults. And so a general tip, uh, sometimes when they give you a question like this, you can just read the little excerpt here and that might be enough to get the question right. But more often than not, you're going to have to go back into the passage or at least think about what you know from reading the passage to answer a question like this, right? So if we think not just about this sentence here, which doesn't really tell us all that much information, Think about how Anne interacts with Matthew and how Anne interacts with Marilla. Now, was she shy? Actually, I don't think she was shy at all. I think she was actually, if anything, she seemed rather forward talking to um, Marilla. And she seemed rather enthusiastic talking to uh, Marilla and interacting with Matthew from everything we can see. So I don't see any evidence that she's really shy responding to adults. So I would take B out based off of that. And also... She says in the text, I'm not ashamed of it, meaning she's not ashamed of the name Anne. She just likes Cordelia better. So I would take C out too because she's not necessarily ashamed of the name. In fact, she says that she's not. So again, another example of, not, you know, sometimes you can't just read that little snippet. Sometimes you do unfortunately have to take the time to uh, either go back and, and reread parts of the text that are near that uh, snippet. Or you might have to just recall, if you have a, a good memory, just recall what you know about the passage too. That could work too, but we're basically now left with A and D because we ruled out B and C. And so we have to think about, you know, what evidence is there given in the text? And for D, do we have any evidence that she's rarely been asked to provide her name? I don't think so, no. All right, so that would then just leave us with A. The words reveal that Anne feels obligated to answer the question. So I think really... At least for me, if I was going to go in and take your test for you, which I obviously can't do, I would be trying to use process of elimination as much as possible on these questions because sometimes the wording is just tricky and the way they're asking things is not always crystal clear. Um, and sometimes multiple answer choices might seem like they're right. And in that case, you have to go with whichever answer choice seems like it's most right based off of the evidence in the passage here. Now, there's not really a whole lot of evidence that she feels obligated to answer the question, but to me that seems more reasonable than D. The words reveal that Anne has rarely been asked to provide her name because we don't really see any evidence that she's rarely been asked to provide her name. Um, but does she feel obligated to answer the question? Well, that could make sense. All right. So again, this is just kind of a tricky question. Just try your best and use process of elimination as much as you can throughout the test. So again, A was the correct answer. Okay, moving right along. So the next question says, how does the author's use of the word but to begin the second sentence of the first paragraph, paragraph function in the excerpt? All right, so, and I, I put the text right here. So this is the first paragraph. It says, Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door, but when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress, with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stops short in amazement. All right, so let's think about this again. Let's just go answer choice by answer choice here. So for A, you know, consider that we're talking just about the second sentence here in the whole paragraph. 
So at this point in the story, it's not clear yet that Marilla dislikes Anne's attire, right? We don't know if Marilla, what she thinks about Anne's attire yet. Her attire, her clothing, how she's dressed. Um, so I would take A out because at this point in the story, we don't really know anything. It's only the second sentence. Now, what about C? It emphasizes, it emphasizes the difference between Marilla's expectations and reality. Well, we know that she was expecting to see a boy, right? So again, remember how I had us do that uh, little exercise where we had to do that, think about the SCCT, the settings, the characters, and the conflict? Well, remember how I said the conflict? Again, we clarified that the conflict was that she thought she was having a boy, or she not that she was having a boy, that she was, uh, she was expecting to adopt a boy. She wasn't giving birth. She was expecting to adopt that boy, and it turned out to be a girl, and now she's kind of shocked. Well, that's why, that's, you know, part of the reason why clarifying key things like that, like the uh, characters and the, the major conflict problem in your mind, can help you get a question like this right faster. Because really, she expected there to be a boy uh, brought to her to adopt. In reality, it turned out to be a girl. So C is looking like the right answer here, but let's, let's review, uh, let's make sure we can eliminate D. Uh, so D, it says we have to, so for D, it says it highlights Morella's reaction to the striking qualities of Anne's physical features. So again, we have to consider the plot here. And remember, the major part of the plot that's really the whole uh, major part of the plot here, and especially what's happening in this excerpt, she thinks that she's going to be adopting a boy, uh, it turns out to be a girl. So again, I don't think that um, the word but, I think it's just showing us, uh, it's helping set up the fact that there's going to be that difference between our expectation and reality. It, it's not really clear um, that this has anything to do with her reaction to Anne's physical features. Okay, so uh, we're now left with C, and uh, so what about B? It distinguishes between her amazement and discouragement. It could be um, that it's possible, but um, I could see why you would think B, but C is the correct answer here according to the study guide, and really it's just, again, I think C is more clear. Um, it's just more in line with what the main conflict is here. The main conflict is she had these expectations in reality. They were basically shattered because it turned out that uh, Matthew brought home a girl here. The word but is not distinguishing between the amazement and discouragement. Okay, so now we're going to read another passage. This is a nonfiction passage. It's a petition, and then we're going to read an article. And so later on in the video, pretty shortly, I'm going to give you a strategy you can use for nonfiction passages that might help you out. But for this one, I'd just like you to try your best using whatever strategy you want. And so let me read this, and then I'll we'll go to the question. So. It says, petition, ban drilling for resources in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. First paragraph, to U.S. Congress. We, the undersigned and A, Greener America, are urging members of the U.S. Congress to protect the nearly 9 million acres of unspoiled coastal plain and mountains in Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, ANWR. For many years, this land has been protected, but recently there has been a renewed call for accessing the oil in the Alaskan wilderness to boost the national economy and increase security. Today, more than 80% of Alaska's state revenues result from the oil and gas business, a direct effect of tapping into Alaska's rich energy reserves. Once again, economic interests in oil drilling and production of natural gas and coal are vying with environmental concerns, and the ANWR is in danger. The damage that could be done to the ecosystem would simply be too great. Recently, new oil and gas extraction methods have led to drilling projects beginning in other states, and the debate has resumed in Congress over whether to permit drilling in the ANWR. Because of these new drilling projects, we do not need the oil from this untouched wilderness. Therefore, Congress must prevent the destruction of the ANWR immediately to achieve the following objectives. Protect the wilderness from drilling processes that cause oil spills and generate waste material. Continue to preserve the breeding and feeding grounds of native animal species such as caribou, snow geese, and polar bears. Prevent the displacement of Alaska natives that would be affected by oil and gas drilling activities. Maintain the stability of local economies that rely on this land for subsistence and tourism. We urge the U.S. Congress to prevent any future removal of natural resources in the ANWR. Okay, so that's the end of the petition. And now we move ahead here to the, the article, right? So the article says, it says, save our refuge. 
by Yvette Altuner, Director, A Greener America for Nature Today, Journal for the Protection of Earth's Wilderness Areas. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be wilderness, but that's how it was in the study guide, so that's what I copied it over as. So it says, Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, ANWR, is home to an impressive variety of wildlife and panoramic views. In fact, the refuge was created in 1960 for the sole purpose of protecting our nation's last remaining wilderness area and maintaining the delicate balance of nature in this rugged Arctic environment. For decades, the area has awed visitors with its majestic tundras, snow-top mountain ranges, and vast wetlands through which flow roaring rivers. The ANWR is also home to many indigenous people who depend on its natural wealth for their continued existence. Allowing oil and gas companies to drill on these untouched lands would destroy the fragile ecosystems that exist there. The risk is just too great, although the companies claim that harm to the ANWR would be minimal. There is too much evidence in nearby drilling areas that suggests this is not true. For example, drilling at nearby Prado Bay has resulted in tens of thousands of gallons of oil spilled each year. In fact, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has studied the potential impact of oil and gas development on refugee resources. The service has concluded that although technological advances have decreased the environmental impacts of oil and gas exploration, obtaining oil and gas is still a disruptive and invasive process. This type of invasive process creates pollution that harms our wildlife and could cause unimaginable devastation to the natural environment in the ANWR. The issue of oil production in the ANWR has caused controversy, and the future of the refuge remains undecided. With the lure of potentially billions of barrels of oil, proponents of drilling see the ANWR as a means to meet the ever-present demand for energy resources. But the promise of economic gains does not offset the expense of drilling in the Arctic, which can cost 50 to 100% more than projects in the lower 48 states. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, EIA, the increased cost is due to weather conditions and other factors unique to this area. Expenses such as transporting the natural gas and oil to fare away consumers and the precautions that are needed to protect employees and equipment from the harsh climate quickly add up. While it is true that technological advancements allow the exploration of formerly inaccessible resources such as the oil and gas fields in the ANWR, these advancements need to be used to explore areas currently in production. In recent years, modern drilling techniques have allowed companies to drill in previously idle fields across the lower 48 states. We simply do not need the oil from the ANWR at this point. I hope that our government will continue the same conclusion before irreparable damage is done to a place that is far too valuable in its present state to exploit. Okay, so the first question here, what is the primary purpose of the petition? A, to convince Congress to oppose drilling for oil and gas in ANWR. B, to convince Congress to support the protection of wildlife in the ANWR area. C, to convince Congress that environmental needs take precedence over economic ones. Or D, to convince Congress that an increase in drilling for oil and gas is a danger to the ecosystem. Okay, so I'd like you to pause the video, try this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so hopefully I had a chance to try this. Let's talk about this here. So the first thing I want you to note is that the question is asking us primarily about that petition, right? So we only want to consider the petition here um, as much as we can. So let's think about B here. Again, B says to convince Congress to support the protection of wildlife in the ANWR areas. Now, it's true that part of the petition mentions protecting the wildlife, but I wouldn't say that's the main purpose. So what about C, to convince Congress that environmental needs take precedence over economic ones? Well, the problem with C is that it's not really specific enough. Uh, when considering C, it is true that in the petition they're arguing that environmental needs should take pre precedence over economics. But remember, the whole thing is really about drilling. And the word drilling comes up again and again and again and again in the article here. Um, and so also with D here, uh, D, it says to convince Congress that an increase in drilling for oil and gas is a danger to the ecosystem. Well, the word ecosystem doesn't come up at all in the petition. The word ecosystem comes up, if I remember right, from a couple minutes ago in the article that we read here. Um, but really the clue, I think, besides you can kind of use process of elimination here, but really the, the main thing that I want you to see here is 
that uh, the word drilling comes came up over and over again. We saw repetition throughout that, the repetition throughout the petition of the word drilling. Drilling, 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 things that pertain to drilling. And if you really look at the title here of the piece, it says petition, ban drilling for resources in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We'll look at A here, to convince Congress to oppose drilling for oil and gas. So a, a quick tip here that I'd like you to try to remember is always check the title of the passage, right? If you see... Um, keywords like drilling in the passage title, and then you also see the word drilling in an answer choice, okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be right, because CD talks about drilling here too. Um, but really, I just want you to remember that, that, that trick. Remember, read the title, look at words in the title, and, and look for answer choices that have a word that matches that, all right? Now, D again, in D, it says to in convince Congress that an increase in drilling for oil and gas is a danger to the ecosystem. Well, the ecosystem, that word didn't come up. If I don't, I don't remember it coming up in the petition, but that was talked about in the article, right? Um, and so just remember here that the whole point is of the whole point and purpose, A is very specific to convince Congress to oppose drilling for oil and gas in the ANWR. It's a very, very specific thing. The word drilling is right there in the title. We know that that is going to be the primary purpose. Okay, so the next question, how are the petition and the article different from each other? A, the petition acknowledges the arguments for drilling in the area, but the article ignores the opposing arguments. B, the petition is designed to influence decision makers, but the article is directed towards convincing a larger audience. C, the petition limits its discussion to the economic impact on the state of Alaska, but the article focuses on the impact for the entire nation. D, the petition disregards the negative impact drilling will have on tourism in Alaska, but the article is concerned about damage to the tourism industry. So as always, you can pause the video, try this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's think here. Oops, I jumped ahead here. Uh, let's think here about the answer choices, right? So if we think about C here, remember that the article also focuses on Alaska. The article doesn't talk about the whole nation. Um, both of them discuss Alaska, so we can rule C out here. Now, about D, I was going to note here about D before I jumped ahead that which discusses tourism? Is that in the petition or is that in the article? Well, remember that uh, tourism, and if you don't remember off the top of your head, you have to look back and see, Tourism is mentioned in that petition, but not in the article. Uh, so I would rule D out based off of that, because it says the article is concerned about damage to the tourism industry. Well, that was actually the petition, right? I don't remember the word tourism even coming up at all in the article. All right, so uh, well, now we're left with both A and B here. The petition acknowledges arguments for drilling in the area, but the article ignores opposing arguments. Is that really true? Well, let's look here at the first uh, paragraph, or at this paragraph here. It says, while it is true that technological advancements allow the exploration of formerly inaccessible resources, such as the oil and gas fields in the ANWR, these advancements need to be used to explore areas currently in production. So it seems like the article is addressing an opposing argument right here. So by process of elimination, I would say B is the correct answer. B is the correct answer here. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the next question says, read the excerpt below from paragraph two of the petition. Which paragraph from the article contains ideas that are similar to the excerpt? New oil and gas extraction methods have led to drilling projects beginning in other states. Paragraph four, paragraph five, paragraph six, or paragraph seven. So as always, you can pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so the correct answer here is D, paragraph seven. So let me show you the text here. It says, again, it says, while it is true that technological advancements allow the exploration of formerly inaccessible resources such as the oil and gas fields in the ANWR, these advancements need to be used to explore areas currently in production. So hopefully that makes sense. So now I want to talk about a strategy you can use for nonfiction. You can use it for fiction too, depending on how the passage sets up. Uh, I did introduce this because the last, I thought that the last two passages we just read had a lot of details and were kind of long, and I just, I didn't thought that it would be more time efficient to use this method for the next passage, but 
the rep paraphrasing it's a strategy there's all kinds of research that it, uh, all kinds of research I've taught this in many videos that I've done before maybe you've seen those and if you're new here then I'm glad that you're here thank you for being here um, maybe you've seen me talk about this before maybe not but the point is that it stands for read the paragraph ask what's the main idea and two supporting ideas and P put it in your own words so really I don't want to throw anybody off here and overload you in this video if you have not really studied what main ideas and supporting ideas are. So really, we're going to take out the A here in this video. And so all we, we're going to do here for the next passage, we're going to read each paragraph. And at the end of each paragraph, just try to pause real quick. You can write it out on paper or you can do it in your head. Just think, how would I put this in my own words or how would I summarize this? How would I explain this to somebody else? And let's see if this helps you get more questions right. And if you're already getting these questions right, great work. But let's see if this will help you more easily get the questions right. So just keep this in mind. So let's read here. I'll read this first. So this is from a discussion of Eleanor Roosevelt's 1948 speech on human rights. Uh, so in 1948, during Eleanor Roosevelt's tenure as chairman of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, she gave a speech. The struggle for human rights at the Sorbonne, Bonne, I don't know how to pronounce that, in Paris, France. She began her speech by informing her audience that her purpose was to talk with them about the preservation of human freedom. Throughout the course of her talk, she tackled several topics, including the Commission's Universal Declarations of Human Rights and the difficulties she and the members of the United Nations faced during the drafting process. Okay, so you can pause real quick if you'd like to, and, and you can do this. I'd like you to just, uh, what are a few points that you would take away from this in your own words? Um, for me, I would say my quick summary would, I would note the setting. This uh, is taking place in uh, 1948 in Paris, in France. And what's happening here, basically it's Eleanor Roosevelt. She gave a speech about preserving human freedom. And I'd like you to note here, or I would note if this was me doing this, that the second paragraph lists topics that she covered, right? It says in the second paragraph, throughout the course of her talk, she tackled several topics and then it lists a couple. So that's just something to note here. Um, and the reason is because if you get questions and you need to quickly look back and find uh, the topics that were actually covered in the speech, the second paragraph might be a spot to refer back to. Okay, so we'll keep reading here. In the speech, the former First Lady outlined the two components of the International Bill of Rights. The first part, Roosevelt explained, served as a declaration of the basic human rights that any individual is entitled to, to no matter where he or she lives. The second part, unfinished during the time she spoke, was a covenant on human rights that would be presented to every nation. It was intended that, once ratified by each nation, the bill would be used as a reference to reshape any national laws that did not conform to the bill's principles. So again, if you'd like to, you can pause the video, just take a moment or two, think about how would you explain this paragraph in your own words in just a bullet point or two. And then when you're ready, I'll show you my quick summary of the paragraph. So if it were me summarizing this, I would say basically what this paragraph tells us uh, is that in the speech, right, so Eleanor Roosevelt outlined the two components of the International Bill of Rights. The first component, basic human rights for everyone. The second was a covenant on human rights to be presented to all nations and used to change national laws not following the bill's principles. Okay, let's keep going here. At the time of Roosevelt's speech, the bill's declaration had been approved by most of the United Nations member countries. However, four nations, including the Soviet Union and other Soviet satellite states, abstained from a vote of acceptance of the bill. Drawing the audience's attention to these nations, Roosevelt described the difficulties in deciding upon universal definitions for the bill's conception of democracy. She drew out the comparison between the United States and the Soviet Union and spoke about the two governments' divergent approaches to and uses of power citing the media in each country as examples, while stating that the U.S. government did not punish expressions of any political viewpoints in its newspapers, Roosevelt suggested that the government and the USSR would close down any papers that criticize its political philosophy. Okay, so again, if you'd like to, you can pause the video and just think about this. Really, just pause and think, how would I break this down? How would I explain this to somebody else? What are some of the most important points here in this paragraph? And 
If I were to do this, which I did do here, I would say basically what's happening here is that it tells us that uh, most countries did approve the bill, but some didn't, and those nations were the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union satellite states. Now, what else is taking place here is that she described the difficulties creating a universal definition of democracy, and she also compared the U.S. and Soviet Union and how the, particularly how the countries differ in the media. Okay, so, and the last is just a conclusion. It says, she concluded her speech by repeating a call to action from the opening statement of the Assembly. Roosevelt passionately encouraged unity for the delegates and asked that they overwhelmingly approve the Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so this is just my summary here. This really just concludes the passage. There's not much to put in your own words here, and at least not my opinion. Now, I just, some people out there, maybe you're wondering right now, when I'm is this going to be practical to do this on my test? When I'm reading, am I going to be able to have time to do this? And the, the correct answer is that if you practice it, you can get pretty fast to doing this. It doesn't take all that long to read a paragraph and just pause. And, and you know, it really shouldn't, you shouldn't really be spending a whole lot of time doing this because you could run out of time. But the thing you have to consider here is ask yourself, what if I get in the habit of pausing and making sure I'm understanding what's happening by restating it in my own words, in my head, or you can type it out on the test too, uh, whatever. Um, you know, is this going to help me get more questions right? And in, in my opinion, if you just get in the habit of pausing briefly to just check your understanding of what's happening, maybe type out a few bullet points, write out a few bullet points, whatever, I think that it's going to help you get more questions right. Um, but if you think it's going to take you too much time to do it, then you don't have to do it. But you just have to ask yourself, you know, is the extra extra time to summarize the passages, is that going to help me get more questions right? I would argue that in most cases it will, at least for the nonfiction. Um, but it's up to you to decide that. Obviously, if you're running out of time on your test, you, you don't really want to pause and, and, and do that too much. But I'm, I'm telling you, it might help your score. Uh, I think it will. And I've gotten feedback on other videos from other people saying that it has helped their score. Up for you to decide, up to you, I should say, to decide. But basically, the question here, the first question says, what approach did Eleanor Roosevelt take to encourage acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? A, she suggested that nations in disagreement with her stance be removed from the commission. B, she warned of the problems that would occur if all nations had different civil rights policies within their borders. C, she acknowledged the difficulty of convincing different nations to agree on common ideas of democracy and power, or D. She compared the abstaining nations with voting nations and suggested the difference, differences between them were insignificant. So I'd like you to pause the video, try this one out, and then we'll go over it. So let's think about A here. So really, A, she didn't mention anything about removing uh, other countries, so we can take A out just based off of that. Now, what about B? Well. She doesn't talk about the problems that would occur if all nations had different civil rights policies. She really focused on the difficulties in coming up with a civil rights bill that everyone would agree on. And, and so, you know, you can remember that topics list that we found, too, if you, you're not sure about that. Remember, it says she tackled several topics, including the Commission's Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the difficulties she and the members of the UN faced during the drafting process. Right. So that's always that could be a good place to refer back to. Um, so really, I would take that answer choice out just based off of that. And so what about D? Well, D says she compared the abstaining nations with the voting nations and suggested that the differences between them were insignificant. So if you're not sure where in the passage that uh, part came up, a lot of the test here is going to be reading questions, looking at the answer choices, then going back to the passages and confirming whether or not an answer choice is true or false. And a lot of people try to rely on their memory, and that's okay if you're good at doing that. I personally would not be able to remember the details that well. I would, for most questions, be referring back to the passages. So please do that as much as you can here. Um, and that's another reason why I think, you know, just bullet points, even if you're just noting where in the passage you can find certain information as you're reading, is helpful because if you needed to find where she compared the U.S. and the Soviet Union, note how in my quick summary I have that in this paragraph she compared the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So if I want to check if D is uh, correct here or if D is false, I just look at my note here and say, okay, well, the part where she's comparing the two countries, that's at the end of this paragraph. So I would simply review that part of it. 
Um, and if you review the highlighted text I have here, you'll see that she certainly doesn't say that the differences between the US and Soviet Union are insignificant. In fact, when she compares the two, she seems to make it clear that there's major differences, like how the USSR uh, uses the media to punish opposing viewpoints, right, which is, does not take place in the US. Uh, so basically, I would rule D out, and through process of elimination, that just leaves us with C. Um, and process of elimination is always good if you have time for it, but really, I mean, C could just pop right out at you here too, just based off of that topic list here. Remember, I highlighted this topic list here early in the passage, right? It says that difficulty she and the members of the UN faced during the drafting process. Now look at answer choice C, it says, she acknowledged the difficulty of convincing different nations to agree on common ideas of democracy and power. So, um, you know, I would always try to use process of elimination as long as you have time. Um, but also just noting certain parts of the passage where topic lists are given, um, like a list of topics that she covered in the speech, or at least the main topics was right here. So that could help us get that right as well. Okay, so we're going to move on to a related passage here, um, and the passage has an image to it. So this says a summary of Harry S. Truman's 1947 speech on civil rights, and we see a photo here, and the caption says, Eleanor Roosevelt speaks with the President Harry S. Truman in May of 1951. She's reporting on her work as a delegate of the UN Human Rights Commission. Okay, so... Now, the text of this next passage says, on June 29th, 1947, the third president of the United States, Harry S. Truman, addressed the 38th annual conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, in a speech calling for civil rights and human freedom. Truman described the efforts his administration had initiated as well as his hopes for the future. So, what would you... If you had to explain this, or if you had to note a few bullet points here, what would you pick? You can pause the video and think about that if you'd like to. Um, so I would say, just, just really quickly here, I would note, if this were me, that this tells us that this event took place in 1947, and what's happening here is that it's President Truman, he gave a speech calling for civil rights and freedom, and he talked about efforts and hopes for the future. That's just simply something I would list if this were me. So, okay, the passage continues to say, opening with a determined tone, Truman urged Americans to work together to repair racial schisms. He suggested that the country had reached a turning point, that for the first time in its history, America was ready and willing to guarantee freedom and equality to all its citizens. He continued with an assertion that the government should protect and provide for all its peoples. According to the president, all Americans should possess decent homes, adequate medical care, worthwhile employment, and the right to a fair trial. Okay, so as always, you can pause the video if you'd like to and just think about how would you explain this paragraph in your own words. Just make sure you understand this paragraph before we move on to the next one. So if I were going to summarize this, I would say this, the most important points um, would be that, in the, that Truman suggested America was ready to guarantee freedom for everyone, also, he stated the government should provide, protect everyone, including homes, medical care, jobs, and the right to a fair trial. Okay, so basically the next paragraph says, Truman did not paint a one-sided naive picture, though. At the heart of his speech was a sobering depiction of the social situation facing the nation during its post-World War II era, which included a discussion of disheartening issues ranging from racially motivated insults and intimidation to mob violence. However, he did not dwell on these grim topics, but instead cited the issues as fuel for promoting change. Now, my quick summary notes for this, I just put them right up on screen, would be basically what's happening here is that it states issues of social situation during the time, uh, and these included some of these issues were racially motivated insults, intimidation, and mob violence. Okay, so the article goes on to say, or the summary of Harry Truman's speech goes on to say, after observing the complexities and expanding and improving federal laws, Truman pointed out several examples of his administration's efforts to make such improvements, including the 1946 appointment of the President's Committee on Civil Rights and the request that Congress pass legislation to extend basic civil rights to people living in both Guam and American Samoa. Additionally, the President cited the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, chaired by former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and the committee's efforts to prepare the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So if you'd like to, you can pause the video and just think about a couple bullet points that you would use to, to summarize the main points in this paragraph here. 
So if it were up to me, I would say, talked about complexities in expanding slash improving laws, pointed out examples of efforts to improve laws like in Guam, American Samoa, also cited the UN Commission on Human Rights, and uh, mentions Eleanor Roosevelt in the Universal Declaration. Okay. Lastly, it says Truman concluded his speech by invoking words Abraham Lincoln had written in 1862. The 16th president had called for the nation to remain united despite classes or conditional barriers, not only for itself, but for future generations. And this is really just a concluding paragraph. There's not really much to summarize here, uh, just the conclusion of the speech. Maybe I would note maybe here it mentions Abraham Lincoln's name. It's always a good idea to just eyeball like any kind of keywords or phrases or names just in case you get a question that says something about Abraham Lincoln um, you could refer back to that part of it but let's go ahead and look at the first question here so the first question here says President Truman mentioned the United Nations Commission on Human Rights during a speech to the NAACP in order to show what a how civil rights legislations worked outside of the US his general support of civil rights in the United States and abroad. C. How the United States had learned valuable civil rights lessons from other countries. What about D. His belief that the United States had civil rights policies that should be adapted, adopted by other countries. So you can pause the video, try to figure that out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so what I would do first of all here, remember the question is asking us about the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So that's kind of a key, that's kind of a hint that you'd want to go back and review the part of the passage that talks about the United Nations Commission. So I've highlighted that here, and I'd like you to note too here. So in my quick summary, remember how I, I made up some bullet points here to kind of summarize some of the key points here? I noted here, cited the UN Commission on Human Rights. So if I had to, had to, was doing this, and there's a time limit here, and I had to go back and review that whole entire passage, uh, you could just skim the passage for the part that talks about the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, and that could certainly work for you. But also just note here that, you know, I have that noted in my summary. So if I just kind of eyeballed my notes here, I would say, okay, this is the paragraph that talks about the UN Commission on Human Rights, because I have that in my quick summary. So again, this might not work for everybody. I'm just kind of trying to show you a method here that just by listing a couple points here, it can certainly help you save time. Now, this part of the passage says, additionally, the president cited the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, chaired by former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and the committee's efforts to prepare the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so just remember here, also in this passage to it, in this part of the passage, it talks about how he requested Congress to pass legislation to extend basic civil rights abroad, right? Like to Guam and the American Samoa. So if you take this information, think about it here, uh, hopefully you'll see that B is the correct answer here. Okay, and then we'll keep moving. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So... The next question here is, uh, it includes this photo here. I tried to put it on screen. I'll read the caption again if you can't see it, because um, you might be on a mobile device, cell phone, whatever, tablet. Um, it says, the question says, how does the photograph in the Truman article extend information in the article about Roosevelt's speech? A, although she did not mention Truman's plan to extend civil rights in Guam and American Samoa, the photograph shows that she supported it. B. Although she did not mention Truman's support for the commission, the photograph shows the president's involvement. C. Although her speech was given in 1948, the photograph shows that the declaration was still unfinished several years later. D. Although her speech was given in Paris, the photograph shows that Truman traveled to France in order to hear it. Now the caption here says, Eleanor Roosevelt speaks with President Harry S. Truman in May of 1951. She is reporting on her work as a delegate of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. So uh, hopefully you can see that text. If not, I read the caption for you. So you could pause the video, try to figure this out, and then as always, we'll go over it. So let's think about A here. Um, just by looking at the photograph, we can't learn anything about how she felt about extending civil rights in Guam and American Samoa, just based off of the photo. I mean, we could assume from the reading that she would support that work, but the photo doesn't give us any specific information about uh, these places. So I would take A out based off of that. Now, what about C? Well, keep in mind that the photograph is just showing the president and Eleanor Roosevelt together. Now, if we look at the clues in the photo, we see here that she's smiling and he's looking at her. 
Um, but we learned nothing about the declaration. We don't see anything, uh, we don't see like a, the declaration in the photo. Maybe it's on the desk there, we can't really tell, but it's not really clear what, um, it's not really clear, right? It's just showing them kind of looking at each other here. Um, so C doesn't give us any specific information about when the speech was done in the photo. Now it does give us a date here, 1951 in the caption of the photo, but it doesn't show us in the photo, we don't learn anything about the declaration being unfinished. We, it doesn't give us that information. So what about D? Well, again, the photo here, we have to look at just what's happening in the photo and what the caption tells us here. So D, the photo doesn't show anything that would tell us where Truman may or may not have traveled. So, you know, in fact, in the background, I see some stars there, which the stars kind of on that flag that could be in America. Maybe the photo was not taken in America. Just based off of this photo here, it's really not clear, right? So maybe if in the background there was like a French flag or there was a sign that said Paris or something like that in the background, like the Eiffel Tower, something that could indicate, you know, that this was taken in France or Paris. But the photo doesn't show us anything. I don't see any clues here that would indicate that Truman traveled to France. So just by looking at this photo, we, we don't know any information that would tell us that uh, Truman traveled to France. So by process of elimination and also just kind of looking at the photograph here, the photograph it's kind of vague. It doesn't give us that much information. We just show a smile from, uh, we just see a smile from Eleanor Roosevelt. So we just assume here, I would say that um, she didn't mention German support for the commission, but the photograph shows the president's involvement. So I would say that that is the most logical conclusion here, and B happens to be the correct answer. So really the key takeaway from this is we just have to look at the photo read the caption, and just look for any evidence that the photo gives us here, all right? And we're, we're not really given much to go off of. It's kind of vague. B is also kind of a vague uh, answer here, but something really specific like D, for example, where it talks about the speech being given in Paris um, and the photograph showing Truman traveled to France, we can't really see anything here that indicates that that's the case based off of just the photo and the caption alone. So that's why I would take D out, for example. Okay. And so let's move on here and, okay, ignore all these red squiggly lines, it's kind of annoying, but we're switching gears now to some grammar type stuff. And the question says, choose the phrase that correctly completes the sentence below. It's been many years since he has been back blank. He would not want to miss this special occasion. A, B, C, or D. So I'd like you to pause the video, take all the time you need with this, and then when you're ready, we're going to go over this. Okay, so the answer to this question is C, and there's really a couple lessons here. The most important one is to know the difference between two spelled T-O-O -O and two spelled T-O. So two basically means also, so maybe I would say, for example, uh, my wife went to the store, I went to, meaning I also went to the store, something like that. Um, or I could also say the word to would mean I went to the store or she went to the store. I went to the south. I went to the north. I went to the Midwest. To spelled T-O means approaching a destination, simply put. Um, so just know the difference between two and uh, two with the spelling T-O-O and T-O. And also then the number two is spelled T-W-O. I didn't type that on the screen, but you should know that. If we're talking about the number two, like uh, he turned two years old, the baby turned two years old, you would spell that T-W-O. I would say that's most important. Um, and now as far as new versus new, know that the word new spelled N-E-W means for the first time. So I could say I got a new shirt meaning, you know, that's the first time I got that shirt. Um, I wore a new shirt, meaning it's brand new. I just got it it's for the first time. Um, and then new spelled with a K is just the past tense of no. So I could say that I knew the answer to that question, meaning I did know that answer, and it's just putting it in the past tense, the past tense of no. Um, so if you see it spelled with a K, new just refers to knowledge or knowing something. And if it's spelled with an N, just know that it's talking about something being brand new um, for the first time, um, something of that nature here. Okay, so now we've got a passage below. It says, the passage below is incomplete. Choose the option that correctly completes the sentence. And it says, Eleanor Gardner, CEO, Skyview PC, Inc. 888 Pile Road, San Mar Marti, Marte, Marti, California, 
I'm not sure. Sorry if you're from there in California. I don't mean any uh, offense by not being able to pronounce that. Not sure how that's pronounced, but it says 94656. Then it says, Dear Mrs. Ms. Gardner, my wife and I have been loyal owners of Skyview computers for over 10 years. We are currently on our third Skyview laptop computer, which we purchased three months ago. We appreciate your competitive prices that allow us to upgrade every few years. Also, we have always been delighted with the compatibility of Skyview products with the software we use for our home-based business. The speed and power of our Skyview products have been blank. And it tells us below the question is, choose the option that correctly completes the last sentence in the paragraph above. A. Outstanding. Your products are always well suited to our needs. B. Outstanding. C. Outstanding. They are always well suited to our needs. Or D. Outstanding. Always well suited to our needs. But note that in D there's a period after outstanding and a capital A. Always. Okay. So pause the video now. Take your time on this. It's a lot to take in here. Uh, and then when you're ready, we'll go over this. Okay, so let's talk about this here. Now, what about A? Well, the problem with A is that there really should be a paragraph after the or after the word outstanding. Or I'm sorry, I don't mean to say paragraph. There really should be a period after the word outstanding is what I meant to say. And the word your should have a capital Y and should start a new sentence. So period after outstanding, capital Y to start the new sentence is what they should have done here. Uh, they could have also maybe put a semicolon in between that, so they could have said outstanding semicolon. Your products are always well suited to our needs. That could have been acceptable as well here, um, but A is incorrect here. So what about C? Well, the problem with C is really very similar here. Um, the problem with C, though, instead of having that comma there, it really should be two new sentences here. So there should be, I would take that comma away, put a period after outstanding, then capital T, they are always well suited to our needs. Alternatively, you could replace that comma with a semicolon, could maybe use a colon there as well, that would probably be acceptable. Um, so I would take C out, though. The main thing you need to understand is that um, we have two complete thoughts here. Right, Skyview products have been outstanding and they are always well suited to our needs. I would just, you know, say there should be a period there and they are always well suited to our needs. Make that a new sentence. That's the problem with C. Okay. What about D here? The problem with D, I would say, is that always well suited to our needs is not a complete sentence. It's not a complete thought. It's a part of a thought. Always well suited to our needs, but it's not a complete sentence here. So they're almost right. They put that period after outstanding, but they said always well suited to our needs instead of they are always well suited to our needs. So if they had just wrote they are always well suited to our needs, that would be perfect. But D is out. So that leaves us just simply with B, the simplest answer. B is correct here. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And the reason when I teach people writing, I usually tell people to stay away from semicolons in the writing or colons because it's not necessary to get a good score on the essay. At least uh, I don't see why it would be. And so I think semicolons just confuse things. So uh, in your own writing, I would always recommend, like for C, for example, if you had something like this in your own writing, I would always, rather than just put a semicolon in there, I would just do a period after outstanding and a capital T to start the new sentence. The reason is just because, you know, some uh, students that have trouble with writing and really have never been that great at writing before um, and now need to do well at writing and have a short period amount of time to prepare for the writing. I just think just throwing uh, semicolons and colons in there, I think it just confuses people in most cases more often than it helps them, but just my opinion there. So I just wanted to note that here as we talk about, uh, so you understand why I'm so big on uh, just replacing, if I had to correct a paper, I would just put a period here and then start a new sentence, but uh, technically you could probably use a semicolon or a colon there as well. So the next question says, choose the phrase that correctly completes the sentence below. Not having to budget for tuition will allow me to reduce my hours at work. Blank, I can take A, B, C, or D. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer here is C, while increasing the number of classes I can take. Sometimes if you just kind of read these, like not having to budget for tuition will allow me to reduce my hours at work and have increased the number of classes I can take. If you just kind of plug in each answer choice and just kind of think about it, read it over a few times, sometimes the one that's correct uh, will just jump right out at you. 
like D just kind of sounds wrong and have increased the number of classes and have increased is talking about something that's already happened in the past. Uh, so that's one reason why D would be wrong. But again, you just kind of have to reason your way through these sometimes just keep reading them and, and the right one will jump out at you. So hopefully C uh, jumped out at you and hopefully you got that one right. Okay, so the next question says, choose the phrase that correctly completes the sentence below. Just in front of the blank will lead off the parade through downtown. A, B, C, or D. So let's have you pause the video, go over this, uh, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer here, what you have to think about here is um, the correct answer here is A, and the reason is because the Ruiz family is just one family, right? So the Ruiz family's float, they own the float, and since it's one family here, uh, the apostrophe needs to go between the Y and the S uh, rather than D. So it says Ruiz families implying unless there's a bunch of different families named Ruiz, like there's like the Ruizes that live in New York, there's a Ruiz family that's a whole different family that just has the last name that lives in Florida or something. Maybe if there's multiple families named Ruiz that are all different families, then maybe you would put the apostrophe after the S, but that's a uh, would be an unusual case here, but it just says uh, in front of the Ruiz family. So it says the Ruiz family. So I would assume it's just one family, the Ruiz family. You put the apostrophe between the Y and the S. Uh, okay. And then it says the, the grand marshal's car. So, uh, the apostrophe needs to go between the L and the S here. And if there were multiple grand marshals, then it would be after the Y, like we see in C and D, or I'm sorry, after the S marshals apostrophe after the s like we see in c and d here um, but that's not the case because it says the grand marshal's car so we would assume that it's just one grand marshal so a is the correct answer just have to know the apostrophe rules for this one and then hopefully you got this answer correct